Hello, everyone. This is a joint production of Friends of Socialist China, The Left Lens, and Multipolarista. I'm Ben Norton. I'm joined by two good friends of mine, Carlos Martinez and Denny Haifang. And today we're going to be talking about the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. This is going on right now in Beijing. This is a very important meeting. Every single, every five years, the uh, the government and the uh, Communist Party in China organize this uh, national congress. And this is very important to plan what the next five years of policies are going to be. So today we're going to talk about what has been decided on. We'll reflect on the report and speech given by President Xi Jinping, which was over 60 pages for two hours. He said a lot of interesting things. Um, some of the main takeaways so far is that although the government talks and the, the of course um, the Chinese government is ruled by the Communist Party of China, so sometimes we, we might use the term party and government a little interchangeably. Although I guess we should be a little more accurate and say the party specifically. Um, the party has talked a lot about what it says is a new era and uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era. Although at the same time, one of the main points they've stressed in this party congress is continuity. So some of the main points that, that they've emphasized so far has been reaffirming their commitment to Marxism and socialism with Chinese characteristics. In his speech, Xi Jinping and, and his report, Xi Jinping mentioned Marxism dozens of times. They also talk about continuing on their path forward and developing and, and pushing for common prosperity to continue uh, decreasing inequality in the country. They reaffirmed their commitment to a zero COVID policy, which we'll talk about, which has saved potentially millions of lives. They have also uh, reaffirmed their commitment to peaceful reunification with Taiwan and, if necessary, military force, although they emphasize that they really want to keep it peaceful. And they also really pledge to continue the fight against corruption. So some of those are some of the main takeaways. And before I, I cut to Carlos and Danny here to kind of reflect on some of these main points, I want to show just the kind of structure of the Communist Party of China so people can understand why this party congress is important. This is the 20th party congress, like I said, every five years. So for 100 years now, the party has met to, to make five-year plans. And this is the structure. And I want to give credit here to, uh, to Dongsheng News. This is from a video that they did explaining the political structure of the Communist Party of China and the government of China. And if you see here, they have a pyramid. I think this is the best way of thinking about the structure of the CPC, the Communist Party of China. The National Party Congress, which is going on right now, it brings together 2,296 representatives, delegates they're called, from every single municipality and province and autonomous region from all over China. And they're elected. They're nominated and elected from their own local communities. So there's 2,296 delegates right now in Beijing meeting for the, the National Congress. Among them, they elect 360 members of the Central Committee. And then the 360 members of the Central Committee elect 25 members of the Politburo, and then the 25 members of the Politburo elect the standing committee of the Politburo. And Xi Jinping is expected to announce the new members of the standing committee on Sunday, which is October 23rd. So there's still a few more days going on of the Congress. And then, of course, the general secretary of the party is the top individual who's the leader of the party. So that's a, that's a very basic overview. I, I just For people who are watching, I wanted to provide a very basic overview of how the Communist Party of China is organized and how the Party Congress works. So um, now I'll, I want to open this up. Carlos, I'll go to you. Um, you've been following this very closely. Can you reflect on, on how important this Party Congress is and, and why people around the world should keep their eyes on what's happening in Beijing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's you know one of the fundamental parts of Chinese democracy alongside the National People's Congresses and alongside the National People's Consultative Committees. And, you know, as, as you've said in the introduction, what's discussed at the moment is going gonna, is gonna to set the tone for China's development in the coming five years. And to be honest, beyond that, I mean, the, the core theme that's, that's really come out of um, 
that's really come out of this this Congress so far, and the core theme that is repeated numerous times in Xi Jinping's speech, his opening speech, his work report to the Congress, is that we're we're putting the building blocks in place to make sure that we can meet our second centenary goal of building China into a modern socialist country in all respects, right? By the centenary of the founding of the PRC, that is uh, by the middle of the century, by 2049. Um, and you know what, what he says, his, his quote from his speech, he says, from this day forward, the central task of the Communist Party of China will be to lead the Chinese people of all ethnic groups in a concerted effort to realize the second centenary goal of building China into a great modern socialist country in all respects, and to advance the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation on all fronts through a Chinese path to modernization. So there's kind of a lot of meaning embedded in that, but I think it kind of encapsulates a huge amount of optimism, a huge amount of confidence, which reflects you know, a parallel optimism and confidence in in among the Chinese population as a whole. And I just I've because it's the 20th Congress of the CPC, I've found it very difficult to avoid kind of constantly in my head making a comparison with the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, <laughs> which, as you guys all know, took place in 1956 and was a very kind of controversial sort of landmark moment in the history of, of 20th century communism. And and sort of in many ways set in train a, a process, I think, of decaying confidence, you know, what the Chinese would call historical nihilism um, that contributed in a fairly meaningful way to the collapse of the Soviet Union a few decades later. And the CPC has quite obviously studied that process, the fall of the Soviet Union, very carefully and is really serious about not making some of those mistakes, particularly with regard to like ideological matters and the maintenance of working class political power. Like on the economic side in China, I mean, reform has gone so much further. Chinese reform since 1978 has gone so much further, like orders of magnitude further than it ever went, than economic uh, than market reform ever went in the Soviet Union, you know, in terms of the quantities of private capital, in terms of the quantities of foreign investment, in terms of, you know, having billionaires, having Starbucks all over the place, KFC, stock exchanges, engagement in global value chains, you name it. Um, but what you very much haven't had in China, of which you did have in the Soviet Union, is political liberalization, by which I mean, you know, like that's not a positive spin on political liberalization. That's liberalization, which means allowing the capitalist class to start dominating the Communist Party. It means giving the capitalist class space to start kind of mobilizing separately towards their own interests and, and start conspiring with the, with the West to overthrow socialism, as happened in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, Deng, Deng Xiaoping very famously laid out at the start of reform and opening up in 1978, what he called the four cardinal principles um, as being kind of fundamental guards against counter-revolution. So those are defend the socialist path, maintain working class rule, maintain the leadership of the party, adhere to Marxism, adhere to Leninism, adhere to Mao Zedong thought. And, you know, through a lot of twists and turns, the Chinese have stuck to that. And you can see just this incredible difference in the results. You know, by the 1980s, the CPUS, uh, the CPSU was suffering you know, a major identity crisis. The Soviet economy was stagnating and essentially a bit of a mess. Living standards were falling behind the West. They were embroiled in an unwinnable war in Afghanistan. Levels of confidence were very low. Levels of optimism were very low and levels of alienation were very high. And it's just contrast that with China in 2022 uh, you know, 44 years after the launch of reform, it's just, it's a very different vibe. You know, the government popularity rating is consistently like 90 plus, 95 plus. Life expectancy in China um, has, has just surpassed that of the United States. It's now uh, 78 point something percent. Obviously, they've dealt with COVID extremely well. China has become, you know, the world leader in renewable energy. It's a world, increasingly a world leader in science and technology and nanotechnology, AI, quantum computing, and so forth. Um, and so there's this huge amount of confidence and optimism. Dealing with corruption is another thing that's really helped in that process of building confidence and building trust and developing sort of a sense of fairness. Um, and, and again, the, the Xi's speech to the Congress really doubles down on this. He, he says, 
we've waged a battle against corruption on a scale unprecedented in our history, driven by a strong sense of mission, we've resolved to, quote, offend a few thousand rather than fail 1.4 billion. Um, and we've decided to clear our party of all its ills. And, you know, that's you know, really strongly um, connected to the whole idea of making the system fairer, building common prosperity, making people's lives better, creating an overall environment characterized by fairness, justice, and the rule of law. So, you know, it's, it's just really look interesting to look at what's going on in the 20th National Congress of the CPC and to see how it reflects uh, the CPC and the Chinese people's vision for, you know, how they see Chinese socialism developing over the coming decades. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, Danny. So what, what are your thoughts so far on the 20th CPC Congress? Well, there's there's a lot to to go over. I mean, one of the most striking things about the Congress is how unique it is in the sense that you have what Carlos called in his latest article in China Today, the most successful political party in the world, the Communist Party of, the, of China, 96 million members. Uh, uh, several thousand of their delegates coming together to review this work report given by Xi Jinping, to review the history of where the party has come, especially since the 18th Party Congress when uh, Xi Jinping was named the general secretary all the way into the 19th and now the 20th uh, National Congress of the party, to review what has happened since then, the achievements. I mean, these remarkable achievements that Carlos reviewed uh, reaching one of the main goals since the 19th Congress was to complete this process of becoming a moderately prosperous society so that now the CPC can turn its attention fully toward socialist modernization and basically achieving modernization by 2035 on the way to what has never existed prior to this point, which is a modern socialist country in all respects. That's the goal here, to reach that by 2050. And uh, what's remarkable about, about this is that the CPC understands all of the challenges before it. This is something that a lot of people in the West, a lot of detractors of China, the China hawks, uh, those in the, uh, in the Beltway in DC, uh, those neocons, uh, and, and really people across the political spectrum, given the heightened anti-China sentiment across the West and the United States leading all of that, uh, often we hear that the CPC is this quote-unquote authoritarian party that doesn't recognize mistakes, that's not critical, and that it's brainwashing all of the Chinese people. Here you have this party congress where one of the strongest messages coming out is there are dangerous storms externally, and there are also a lot of challenges internally that need to be addressed simultaneously if the CPC is going to be successful in achieving this goal and fulfilling its promises to the Chinese people, which are everything to the Communist Party of China. And that has been shown quite evidently in how the Communist Party has led the way in achieving the end of absolute poverty and being able to meet these markers that Carlos spoke about and to go forward into the future to focus on high quality development, which development no surprise here was the most uh, 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 referenced word in the work report, but high quality development was especially emphasized because now it's not just a matter of can we get China to be a prosperous country? China has relatively achieved that. Now it's about how can everybody share in these benefits, not just in China, but around the world. And that I think is a very remarkable a mission to have in this moment where the rest of the world, uh, we were joking about the UK situation, the musical chairs happening with the prime minister position. Uh, we could talk about the United States and the illegitimacy of its governance system, but all across the so-called quote unquote civilized West, we see a market decline and the CPC is showing that actually it's not only in a state of renewal, but it really is in a, in, in a high state of becoming a rising player in the world stage and that this national Congress, all of what is coming out of it is really demonstrating to the world where the future resides. And that resides in the priorities of 
the Communist Party of China and how those priorities reflect really humanity's priorities to end poverty, to address climate change, to address things like public health crises and pandemics, and to forward a vision of peaceful development with an emphasis on peace, right, to be able to forward a peaceful vision for how to relate to other countries. I mean, all of this is really what is in the cards and, and nations around the world are paying attention very closely. Yeah, I want to reflect on some of the similarities and differences with the last party congress in 2017. Um, that is the 19th party congress. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping is is widely expected to be entering his third term. The party congress is, still goes on for two more days. It ends on uh, the 22nd, um, 22nd, 23rd, depending on what time zone you're looking at. Now, in the 19th congress. The Communist Party of China made a very significant difference. This is something that I recently did a Twitter thread about. In the 19th Congress back in 2017, the uh, party announced that socialism with Chinese characteristics had entered a new era. And they basically said that previously, after the opening up period um, initiated by Deng Xiaoping, that the Chinese government and the Communist Party had focused on developing the productive forces because they made the assessment that you can't develop socialism when the country, when the productive forces in the country are not developed. You have to be able to develop those productive forces in order to create, you know, a very large economy in order to then create enough wealth to share among working people. And in 2017 at the 19th Congress, they made the assessment that basically China has developed the productive forces to, to a stage where now the main goal is not simply just to grow the economy and the productive forces, but it's to fight inequality and support this idea that they call common prosperity, which goes back to Mao himself. Mao talked about common prosperity. And if you read the um, the main, the publication of the main takeaways from the 19th Congress, again, this was five years ago, they the, the CPC wrote, quote, the principal contradiction of the Chinese society has evolved in the past, the contradiction was between the ever-growing material and cultural needs of the people and the backwardness of social production. So that's them saying that in the past, before 2017, the goal was to grow the economy because the economy was underdeveloped because of the period of humiliation, of colonialism, and of feudalism. And they said that now, as of the 2017, the principal contradiction is between unbalanced and inadequate development and the people's ever growing needs for a better life. So that was them acknowledging that the new goal of the CPC is to fight uneven development inside the country. So the government and the party have prioritized decreasing the inequality between the Eastern coastal regions, which tend to be much more developed and wealthy, you know, big cities like Beijing and Shanghai, and trying to uh, decrease the inequality between those regions and a lot of the rural areas, especially in the West. And this leads to the policy of development in Xinjiang, which has led to a lot of Western disinformation and propaganda attacking the government. So there's also, there's uneven development. And then there's also raising the, the living standards of poor and working people. The government has already lifted more than 850 million people. I wanna repeat, repeat that, 850 million people out of poverty and now that China has eliminated extreme poverty, its goal is to uh, to decrease inequality. So that they in the last party Congress, they talked about the increasing demands for fairness and justice, rule of law, security, the environment, balanced urban and rural development, and equitable income distribution. So that's a reflection on basically the main developments of the 19th party Congress. In my assessment, maybe you guys disagree, I think the 19th Congress five years ago represented more of a shift compared to the previous party Congresses. And I think what we see now in the 20th Congress is Xi Jinping is reaffirming the party's commitment to those goals established in the 2019 Congress and committing to go down further down this path of fighting for common prosperity, of fighting against uneven development, fighting against inequality, and of course, uh, the other points he stressed, reunification with Taiwan, 
and the, the zero COVID policy. So I'm wondering, I'll go back to you, Carlos. I'm wondering if you think that maybe this Congress doesn't represent necessarily a mark, a marked shift, but it does represent that the, the, that China and the party is very much on a, they have a set path and they're going to continue moving forward to progress. Yeah, I think that's right. And I just wanted to cycle back quickly to, to the point that you made in relation to the principal contradiction, because that's, that's just such an important point. And I think we should double down on it a little bit, you know, um, famously following the death of Mao Zedong in 1976, um, you know, the party leadership abandoned what had previously been considered the principal contradiction. Like during the period of the Cultural Revolution, the principal contradiction had been defined as a class struggle, uh, a, a struggle between the workers and peasants who are trying to build socialism and the capitalist roaders in, in the intellectual class and among the party leadership who'd infiltrated the party and that were trying to push a capitalist road. Um, the post-Mao leadership led by Deng Xiaoping and Chen Yun uh, switched that um, definition of the principal contradiction towards um, you know, the different the, the contradiction between on the one hand people's growing material needs and China's relatively backward social productive forces. And that definition of the principal contradiction drove the whole reform strategy from 1978, the absolute top priority on the development of the productive forces, putting the building blocks in place such that all Chinese could live well, putting the building block blocks in place such that common prosperity, um, that it was possible for common prosperity to become more than a dream, but become a material reality. And you know, it has to be said that all things considered, that strategy was extremely successful. You know, the, in terms of development of productive forces, breaking out of underdevelopment, breaking out of poverty, it's been incredibly, I mean, unprecedentedly successful. But it also came with you know, very serious negative components particularly in relation to corruption and particularly in relation to like stark inequality. And you know, you're right to say that the 18th and 19th Congresses really set a path to, to address those negative components. And with, with this idea of common prosperity now, and you know, which as you said, you know, I think has been part of the CPC lexicon since the early 1930s, but now it's really moved to center stage in CPC's policy making. And so there's a big focus on the move towards tackling relative poverty, reducing inequality between social groups, between regions, between city and countryside, increasing the size of the middle income group in Chinese society, which is already enormous. You know, the, the middle income group is already like half a billion people. Um, but the idea is that that will be like the, the larger part of, of the Chinese population will fall into this middle income group. There's going to be a big emphasis on rural development, ensuring that that you know everybody, regardless of whether they live in the city or the village, has access to good quality education, good quality healthcare, modern energy, good infrastructure, and so on. Um, you know, so there's they're they're really highlighting this vision of a modern, a prosperous China where everybody can essentially live well, where everybody's basic needs are met, where everybody has good opportunities, good education, you know, a strong cultural life and so on and so forth. And, you know, I think for, for those of us that are on the left, that are progressive, that are socialists, that are Marxists, et cetera, you know, it's just, it's an extremely inspiring vision and it's, a, it's really great to see. I think you're right that there's been more continuity this Congress compared to uh, the last couple of Congresses. Uh, certainly common prosperity is a continuation big focus on ecological civilization, which is also a continuation. I think what's changed a little bit is um, a focus on self-reliance. And there's also been you know, a certain amount of talk about developing um, or modernizing China's military. Um, and you know, the, the international situation has changed a little bit. And, and she talks in his speech about uh, grave, intricate international developments and a series of immense risks and challenges. And what he's pointing to there is this rising new Cold War. Um, and you know there wasn't so much mention of this, I don't think, at the previous Congresses. Um, the, the new Cold War hadn't really kicked off in a major way at that point. Of course, Obama's pivot to Asia started in 2011, but there's, it's 
escalated massively under the Trump regime and now under the Biden regime. Um, you know, the, the US and its allies have quite overtly come to consider China as an enemy, as a strategic competitor. They've launched a new Cold War against it. They're deepening their encirclement and their containment efforts, stepping up their military alliances. You know, they've launched AUKUS, this, you know, um, trilateral pact for basically for Britain and, and the US to provide Australia with uh, uh, weapons grade nuclear material for their submarines, um, push to, to expand, like to consolidate the Quad, undermining of the one China policy, provision of weapons, provision, provision, provision of support and finance to Taiwan and separatist forces, uh, encouraging Japan's rearmament, increased freedom of navigation assertions in the South China Sea. There's talk of developing a global NATO. Combined with that, there's a propaganda war that is something that we've talked about before, in, in particular by spreading these kind of absurd and quite disgusting slanders about human rights in Xinjiang. They're waging an economic war, for example, with preventing the export of semiconductors to China, imposing sanctions on China, um, trying to prevent Huawei's involvement in network infrastructure worldwide and so on. Um, so in that context, I think the, the impression that I'm getting from the current National Congress is that there's a lot more focus on China relying more on its own resources with the expectation that the West is just going to become increasingly aggressive. And that means that China has to be um, more self-reliant and more vigilant in relation to its own security. Yeah, Danny, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that you saw the very lengthy report that uh, President Xi gave to the, the party Congress. Um, you know, it's like 64 pages, depending on, you know, the version. So it was about two hours. What, what were the main takeaways that you got from that speech and from the other comments that have been made so far at the Congress? Yeah, well, uh, to just follow up with what Carlos was saying, I mean, it, Xi Jinping says it. Uh, said it very clearly in this work report that, you know, external threats to China uh, it could, could escalate at any moment. And, and I think that this is one of the most significant changes between the last Congress even to this one, is that these escalations are much more dire. They're much more serious, uh, even just in the last year or two alone, where we've seen what the Biden administration has done to continue on the uh, the Trump version of the new Cold War against China. So I, I think there's that element that is striking in the sense that it, there is a deep acknowledgement. And that means that there is a lot of attention to this. And I think the most important part about this is not only that China is going to continue to ensure that its military is prepared and ready for these potential threats, but that the leadership of the party, of the Communist Party of China, is ready to do what it needs to do politically to ensure that any kind of interference is addressed accordingly. And I also want to add that I think one of the things that we noticed in this report is that uh, the CPC is very aware of the external challenges as a whole, not just toward China, but also what the economic situation really is uh, showing China at the moment. China cannot pursue maybe the kind of development, the growth that it really would want, given that the United States and NATO countries, the EU, have completely and utterly tanked the global economy in many ways, especially their role in it. So these major economies in the world are on the decline. They're all on the way toward recession. And that does hurt China's ability to grow maybe as much as it wants. But so China's emphasis and the CPC's emphasis here, and I think this is so important, is how do you in this environment continue to fulfill the promises that you have made to the Chinese people? And one of the ways is by continuing to promise growth, but high quality growth where incomes are going to rise, standards of living are going to rise in conjunction with, in alignment with, in parallel to the rise of economic growth. And so, you know, we can expect, as, as China has already mentioned, that its economic growth numbers are going to be lower. But it really is targeting, and the CPC is targeting, what it means to protect 
the ecology, the world ecology, what it means to navigate these storms, these dangerous storms that are mentioned many times uh, when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to what are these external challenges that could escalate at any moment, mainly with the United States, mainly with uh, the European countries acting as vassals to the United States, and then what it means for uh, China to pursue high quality development led by the CPC, where the CPC is really leading the way toward lifting the standards of living of all Chinese people to an even further degree. And, and I think that for me is the biggest takeaway of the work report. It's that yes, development, opening up uh, markets, uh, uh, high tech, uh, making sure that the productive forces continue on a path forward is very important. But now China has reached the stage where not only does it does it want to pursue uh, these goals of uh, uh, common prosperity, but really the world situation is also saying that this is very necessary. Self-reliance is incredibly necessary in order to uh, continue on the path forward. Uh, there is no uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, na naivete here around how the United States, how these uh, very hostile governments toward China are behaving. There's no naivete at all. China, the CPC is very clear, and, and I think we should be very clear too. And, and I think that's the big lesson that I've taken away from that work report is how strong it is in uh, labeling and naming these external challenges. Yeah, very well said, Danny. I do want to talk about Taiwan and the very aggressive posture that the U.S. has taken because there's been a lot of very hyperbolic media reporting claiming that Xi Jinping threatened Taiwan and is going to invade as soon as this year and whatever. I mean, um, but before we get to Taiwan, I do want to respond and highlight, respond to what Danny just said and highlight a few points. This is a transcript of Xi Jinping's report, the, the report, which is the speech he gave at the party congress. And th there's a really interesting part here that is that is dedicated specifically to discussing improving the people's well-being and raising quality of life. I think this is very important because it it shows this commitment that we were discussing that the party has made to not only just develop the economy and get out of poverty, but now having eliminated extreme poverty, having lifted 850 million people out of extreme poverty, the goal is to to increase equality, to decrease inequality. So if you look at what she said here, he has a part that talks about improving the system of income distribution, which means redistribution of wealth, right? So he talks about, we will promote equality of opportunity, increase the incomes of low income earners, and expand the size of the middle income group. We will improve the policy system for distribution based on factors of production explore multiple avenues to enable the low and mid middle income groups to earn more from pro production factors. We will enhance the role of taxation, social security, and transfer payments in regulating income distribution. We will improve the personal income tax system and keep income distribution and the means of accumulating wealth well-regulated, including a just excessive income. So obviously what he's saying here is more redistribution of wealth. So they're going to be increasing taxation on the wealthy, redistributing that wealth to poor people. And at the same time, they're also pushing for full employment to promote high quality and full employment and also integrating the urban and rural employment policy systems. So what he's saying is here is that the party is now emphasizing in the five years coming forward. Uh, income redistribution, taxing the wealthy, and decreasing the inequality between rural and urban areas, and especially encouraging more employment in rural areas, acknowledging that rural areas have been left behind to an extent by a lot of the economic growth. And then he also, in, in the speech, he calls for improving the social security system and improving the healthcare system. So these are all, you know, policies that anyone who who's progressive, who's left wing, yet alone a socialist, these are policies that, of course, anyone should support decreasing inequality, 
increasing income redistribution, taxing the wealthy, pushing for, for full employment, decreasing the inequality between rural and urban areas, increase, boosting social security for elderly people, boosting the healthcare system. These are all things that are a key part of the Communist Party's of Chi Party of China's policies in the five years coming forward. And it, it shows the, the emphasized priority on common prosperity and not simply just economic growth for, for the sake of having economic growth. I should point out that China has the largest economy in the world today, if you measure it in terms of purchasing power parity, which is a much better measurement than just looking at GDP in US dollars, considering people in China don't use US dollars. They use you know, the ren ren renminbi, the Chinese yuan for their currency. So it's better to have a measure of purchasing power parity. So now that China is the largest economy in the world, it's kind of changing its priorities. And this gets me to the topic of Taiwan that I mentioned. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll pivot to you here, Carlos. Um, we see a lot of Western media reporting that is hyperbolic. In fact, there was a report saying that the one of the chiefs of the U.S. Navy says that the U.S. military should plan for a potential military intervention in Taiwan as soon as this year or 2023. This is a report in the South China Morning Post. U.S. Navy should prepare for an invasion of Taiwan as soon as this year. He said the U.S. needs to plan for a 2022 window or potential 2023 window. This is according to the chief of U.S. Naval Operations, uh, Michael Gilday. And he said that the U.S. military has to have a fight tonight posture. So basically what the U.S. military is saying is we should have war with China as soon as this year or next year. Joe Biden himself has repeatedly said that if the Chinese government takes action to forcibly reunify Taiwan against these U.S.-backed separatists, that the U.S. is going to militarily intervene, despite the fact that on paper, the U.S. claims to recognize the one China policy that Taiwan is part of China, which goes back to the three communiques that the U.S. government signed with China in the 1970s in order to establish relations with the People's Republic of China. So, Carlos, what do you what do you take of the comments made by Xi and the other decisions and declarations made in the party Congress in terms of re reunification with Taiwan? Well, reading Xi's speech, it's you know it's clear that there's been no change in 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 the PRC's policy in relation to China, um, and it's it's there's actually been very little change over the course of seventy years. Um, and I'll just read a quote, um, if that's okay, from the speech. He says the policies of peaceful reunification and one country, two systems are the best way to realize reunification across the Taiwan Strait. This best serves the interests of Chinese people on both sides of the strait and the entire Chinese nation. We will adhere to the one China principle and the 1992 consensus. Um, so, you know, we'll work with a uh, social structure in Taiwan to promote peaceful development of cross-strait relations and advance the process of China's peaceful reunification. So he reiterates this expression you know, multiple times. And you can see this throughout the history of the Chinese Communist Party's writings and, and statements in relation to Taiwan. Um, but of course, you know, it's it's also um, it's it's a component of the Chinese constitution that the that China it's you know the Chinese reunification is a historical inevitability. It's a, a problem that's been handed down to the current generation of Chinese leadership by history, by a history of colonialism, by um, the century of humiliation, and it will be resolved. And if the West insists on supporting separatists in Taiwan, if it insists on undermining the One China policy, um, if it insists on escalating, then it, you know the the CPC, the the Chinese government, the Chinese military are never going to give up their their right to retake Taiwan by force if that's if that's what the situation comes down to. If Taiwan were to de declare in independence um, and to become essentially a vassal state of the United States and, and part of the first island chain to encircle and contain China, of course China will do what is necessary to prevent that from happening. But China's policy hasn't changed at all and China's behavior hasn't changed at all in relation to Taiwan. What's changed is the West's policy. You know, the West is 
actively escalating around the Taiwan question. It's actively provoking China. And ultimately, I think what that reflects, and you know, a few commentators have said this, that basically the US has lost its ability to outcompete China in the economic field. You know, the US is is in a is in a phase of permanent stagnation and decline. And its neoliberal economic model, which has been uh, prevalent for four decades, is a, is a proven failure. Whereas China continues to rise, you know, China is increasingly um, a, a global leader in science and technology. Increasingly working class people in China live well compared to their counterparts in the West. So, the, you know, the US can't compete on a, on a science, economics, technology basis anymore. But where they can compete is military. And so I think it's what's happening is that they're actively trying to shift their competition from the economic field to the military field, and which is why uh, the question of uh, military, military modernization that Danny referenced is so important. You know, yeah, uh, what, we should be very clear that China follows a fundamentally defensive military strategy. China wants peace. You know, it's not an accident that China hasn't been at war for 43 years. You know, Britain certainly can't say anything like that. The United States certainly can't say anything like that. Uh, it's not an accident that China is the only country to have a no first use uh, policy in relation to its nuclear weapons. But China has to be able to defend itself. You know, bear in mind, the US military budget is three times higher than China's, uh, in spite of the fact that China's population is four times bigger. China has 14 land borders, the United States has two. Um, China is being subjected to an encirclement and can, uh, containment campaign, the US isn't. Um, so, you know, military modernization is, is uh, you know, you can see it as a necessary evil. That's something, you know, if China doesn't develop the tools and the means to, to defend itself, then that it puts itself in a very vulnerable, a very dangerous situation. On the positive side, in relation to uh, China's international relations, you know, China continues to be the most prominent force pushing very strongly for multipolarity, for peaceful development, for non-interference, for adherence to the UN Charter, for respect for sovereignty. You know, and while you've got the US and its allies are pursuing division and conflict everywhere via NATO, via AUKUS, the Quad, G7, etc., China's promoting cooperation via the Belt and Road, via the Global Development Initiative, via the Global Security Initiative, via the BRICS, via the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, via um, its, its relations with the African Union and the Forum of Africa-China Cooperation, via its relations with CELAC and with ASEAN. Um, and that global vision is another thing that comes out of this National Congress and of Xi's work report. Um, just to reference one last quote on that, he says, the CPC is dedicated to human progress and world harmony. We sincerely call upon all countries to hold dear humanity's shared values of peace, development, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom, to promote mutual understanding and forge closer bonds with other peoples and to respect the diversity of civilizations. You know, that really encapsulates the CPC's global vision, this idea of uh, a common future for humanity. And it's profoundly different to what we get from the imperialist powers. Very, very well said. I mean, this is such an important point that we can't stress enough. I just wanna show a very brief video clip from the speech that was given by China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, at the United Nations General Assembly this, this past September. China is the only country in the world that pledges to keep to a path of peaceful development in its constitution. It is the only one among the five nuclear weapon states that is committed to no first use of nuclear weapons. Yeah. Those are things that you just mentioned, Carlos, but I, it's, it's very important to, to hear that reiterated by China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, at the United Nations. It's the only country in the world that in its own constitution says that it pursues a path of peaceful development. Can you imagine the US constitution, which you know goes back to the 18th century and was written by slave owners, that can you imagine them saying, yeah, uh, our, we are committed to a path of peaceful development and we would never be the first power to use nuclear weapons. I mean, it's just unthinkable.
Um, Danny, there, there are a lot of things that we could continue talking about. I mean, um, wherever, wherever you want to pivot is, is great for me. There are a few thoughts that I had. Um, one is, I think, something that's very important in this 20th Congress that we've seen emphasized is the role of national minorities in China. China is not just the Han ethnic group. There are many different ethnic groups and nationalities. Um, you know, there's been a lot of propaganda in Western media about the Uyghur Muslims, but there are actually dozens of national minorities, and they're all represented at the party congress. An another important point is the concept of whole process people's democracy. This is a term that we see repeated a lot in the um, documents and speeches from the party congress, the importance of strengthening this idea of whole process people's democracy which they juxtapose against Western capitalist bourgeois so-called democracy in which a bunch of billionaire capitalist oligarchs can buy off politicians and bribe everyone and corruption is basically legal because it's part of the political system. Another concept is what Carlos mentioned of the idea of the ecological civilization. And we did see that in his speech, uh, President Xi really highlighted the importance of fighting against climate change. And I should point out here um, this is a graph that was from Bloomberg. So it's certainly not, you know, communist propaganda. This is a, a, a Western corporate media outlet named after and owned by a billionaire capitalist. And it acknowledged in this incredible graph here that China is building more renewable energy infrastructure than all other countries on Earth combined. So as an example, in 2021, the United States installed 28 gigawatts worth of renewable energy. In 2022, this year, China is installing 156 gigawatts of solar panels and wind turbines. So this is, I mean, those are all important points. Ecological civilization, whole process, people's democracy, the representation of national minorities. Uh, you know, there, those are a lot of different topics I wanted to bring up, but I'm wondering what you think, Danny. Well, all of them are related. And in the work report presented by Xi Jinping, but it is it is important to emphasize that this work report was not written by Xi Jinping. It was written uh, by the Central Committee with the consultation and the help of all of the delegates that are participating now at the CPC National Congress, over 2,200. And so uh, all of these concepts that you mentioned, Ben, are related to the important theme of this work report, which is Chinese socialist modernization. So modernization particular to China, particular to China's model of socialism with Chinese characteristics. And, and in this report, I think this is very related, you know, uh, to kind of bounce off of Carlos's prior point, you know, Xi Jinping read that in pursuing modernization, China will not tread the old path of war, colonization and plunder taken by some countries. You can imagine what those some countries are, the United States and its Western partners. Uh, that brutal and bloodstained path of enrichment at the expense of others caused great suffering for people of developing countries, which China, and in, in this report, uh, the CPC mentioned China is still a developing country. We will stand firmly on the right side of history, on the side of human progress, dedicated to peace, development, cooperation, and mutual benefit. We will strive to safeguard world peace and development as we pursue our own development and make greater contributions to world peace and development through our own development. So here, I mean, in terms of all the concepts you mentioned, it is absolutely critical for the CPC to continue on making progress in its policy of uplifting the uh, cultural and economic strength of its own national minorities, which there are over 55. I think there, I believe there are 56. And all of these ethnic minorities have very particular history in China, some of which have unfortunately, before the revolution, had to experience much higher levels of impoverishment than others. So there was unequal development in that area. And China has done an incredible job of evening out the uh, standards of living for all uh, people across ethnic groups. And then when it comes to this whole process democracy, I mean, what's so important, I think, to take from this National Congress, you showed the structure of the CPC earlier from Dong Sheng, that graphic. It's important to note that uh, the CPC's model of governance internally, uh, in part, mirrors what happens in China externally for party members uh, and non-party members as a whole. That in this work report, uh, the CPC uh, said that it's going to strengthen the People's Congresses, which are the uh, 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 bodies 
that govern uh, the municipalities, the townships, the villages, the provinces, all the way up to the National Congress, that these people's congresses are a form of direct democracy for people at the lowest level to be able to participate electorally, to be able to elect uh, their delegates, and then those delegates then elect to the higher structures. And uh, China has been touting this, especially of late, publicly, in order to present uh, what its governance system really looks like because of all of the slander that it has received from those very countries it is naming as the primary promoters of colonization and war and plunder. So I think all these concepts are related and the CPC is forwarding a vision of what a Chinese-led alternative looks like, that it's not imposing any of its models, its governance models, how it treats ethnic minorities, anything like that onto any other country. But it's showing the way of how China can pursue its own peaceful and sovereign development politically, economically, militarily, in terms of its policies toward ethnic minorities, and how that can translate into how China relates to the rest of the world in terms of peaceful development, in terms of addressing, I mean, the incredible patience of China around this Taiwan question we have been talking about uh, uh, just a moment ago. You have multiple U.S. officials, including Nancy Pelosi, which all of us covered in some respect when she visited in August, that reckless visit that brought the U.S. and China possibly at the brink of war, the incredible patience of the CPC to be able to respond in a way that both ensures that China and uh, the compatriots, as the CPC calls them, in Taiwan can work out the best arrangement for them in terms of how to uh, reunify, how to uh, continue along the path of a united China, of a one China, and how to address these extreme external challenges, this political and military interference in Taiwan, which does threaten war in China, in, in, led by the CPC, has shown that it can respond, and it will respond, and it will uh, defend its territorial integrity, its sovereignty, but at the same time ensure that really what the CPC is doing is it's not imposing on anybody. It is showing by example, leading by its actions, and uh, uh, able to reflect upon the challenges, the errors, right? Because there's a lot in this report about what needs to be done, what has not yet been accomplished, what is to be accomplished, right, in terms of being able to address this relative poverty, continue on the path of fighting corruption, despite hundreds of thousands of these anti-corruption cases, a wildly successful campaign, which all people in China uh, back, at, I think at a clip of like 97% of people approve of this policy of being able to renew uh, the CPC's leadership in this way and be able to uh, have a direct stake in how the CPC uh, tackles what is a very real problem, corruption, for any kind of political process, uh, given the kind of world that we live in. And so there's all of these interrelated points. And the CPC, I think what's so important about this work report and about those concepts that you mentioned is that they, they all connect, right? What China is doing internally, what the CPC is charting forward internally, really does reflect upon how China behaves with the rest of the world and in the rest of the world. And that is something I think the United States and the West, its Western vassals, the European vassals, are very afraid of, right? They, they talk all about this China, quote unquote, threat. Then they say China's going to invade Taiwan. China's going to do this. China's doing it's a call, it's a colonialist, it's an imperialist. Really, what the West and the United States leading it is afraid of is that this model that the CPC is leading in terms of its vision and implementation is going to be more attractive to the rest of the world as a, a, a potential partner in cooperation for their own development processes. And it's already happening. And so the, the fear is very real because, as Carlos mentioned, the Belt and Road Initiative and China's leading role in institutions like BRICS, which is set to grow with Iran submitting an application earlier this summer and now Saudi Arabia potentially being interested. I mean, we're talking about major headwinds, major changes that the CPC is very aware of. And the United States and the West, these external, these, these certain countries that the CPC mentions, these external challenges, uh, uh, they are very aware of them too. And, and I think uh, it, 
that is what makes all of these concepts uh, very related. Yeah, Danny, you mentioned a really important point, and that is how extremely popular the Chinese government is among actual people in China. And of course, we should be talking about what people in China think about their government and not, you know, these hawks in Washington and London and Brussels. This is a study that was by Harvard University. So you cannot, they cannot be accused of being a bastion of, you know, Communist Party influence. They did a study in 2016, again, Harvard, and found that 95.5% of people in China were relatively satisfied or highly satisfied with the government. 95.5. And there actually have been other studies since then, including there was a study that was backed by NATO, ironically, that found very similar numbers. And th this Harvard study points out that a, a study from the same year in 2016 from Gallup found that in the United States, only 38% of people had uh, confidence, were satisfied with the U.S. federal government. And that number has only shrunk since then. So, I mean, when even Harvard is acknowledging this, this is, this is not Chinese propaganda or whatever, right? This is not Xinhua. This is Harvard University acknowledging that China, the Chinese government is quite literally one of the most popular governments in the world. And we need to understand why that is. Instead of Western propaganda trying to convince us that everyone's brainwashed and they secretly hate their government or whatever. No, I mean, that's that's infantile. Um, Carlos, there's there's so many directions we could take this in. I mean, I know we don't want to spend all day doing this, so um, you know, I will probably do about 15 minutes more. But I raised a few points. Maybe you, you'd be interested in responding to one of them, like uh, the concept of ecological civilization or whole process people's democracy or the representation of national minorities? I'm curious what other topics you think we should cover today. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot and time is limited. If it's okay, I'll probably come in on just quickly on whole process people's democracy and then say something about ecological civilization. Um, you know, you're talking about approval ratings and, and the US government's approval rating being 38% and China China's approval rating being 95%. Although, to be fair, you're quoting that bastion of Marxist-Leninist thought, Harvard University. So I don't know <laughs> how seriously we can take those numbers. Um, but I just would note that Liz Truss's approval rating prior to her resignation yesterday was 18%. Um, <laughs> and, you know, this is, this is from the birthplace of modern democracy, Britain. Um, it, it's really interesting. And one seeming invariant is... Uh, a, a racist approach to China and to the developing world and to the global South in general from the so-called first world, from the US, from Western Europe. And you know, that racism takes somewhat different forms. Under the Trump administration, it took a very overt form, right? You know, when Trump was talking about the Wuhan virus and the China virus and the Kung flu, and he was talking about China raping our economy and you know, how what China's done to us is the worst crime in history, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Biden is a more sophisticated politician. The Democratic Party is a more sophisticated organization than the Republican Party. But, but the, the substance, the content of the politics is actually very similar. You know, Biden stopped talking about the Kung flu, but he started talking about, he started framing the attack on China in terms of, democracy versus authoritarianism. And he even, you know, he, he launched in December last year, this summit for democracy. And very tellingly, basically all the white countries were invited, like every country in uh, uh, Western Europe, Central Europe, North America was invited, Australia, New Zealand, etc. Hardly any African countries were invited. Couple of, couple of Caribbean countries were invited. You know, a couple of Asian, you know, the, the, the Métis in Asia were invited. Japan was invited. Um, you know, certain Latin American countries were invited. Obviously not the ones that we don't like. Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Bolivia. Um, but, you know, they've, they've tried to frame their anti-China narrative around this idea that China's authoritarian. It's undemocratic. 
And what's really been interesting, and this is again, it's reiterated at the National Congress, the Chinese have really come, uh, you know, come out swinging on this question. They're, they're, they're very clear, clearer, I would say, than they've ever been, probably since the period of new democracy, since the early 1950s, that, hold on, we've got a democracy. Uh, it's a socialist democracy. It's a people's democracy. It's actually a better democracy. It's more democratic. Um, and, you know, to, just to quote again from Xi Jinping's speech, he says completely, like with utter clarity, China is a socialist country of people's democratic dictatorship under the leadership of the working class based on an alliance of workers and farmers. All power of the state in China belongs to the people. People's democracy is the lifeblood of socialism and it's integral to our efforts to build a modern socialist country. Whole process people's democracy is the defining feature of socialist democracy. It's democracy in its broadest, most genuine, most effective form. And, you know, if you just look at how democracy operates in China and how people engage with the system of National People's Congresses, which operate not just on the national level, but below that, the provincial level, the regional level, the town level, the village level, you know, people, are, you know, ordinary people are involved in running their lives in politics at every level on a mass scale. And it is funny, well, when Danny and I were in Beijing in January 2020, we were having a conversation with a friend of ours who works at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And you know, Trump was still in power at the time. She, and she just said, what kind of democracy is this where money buys you power? You know, someone like Donald Trump, he couldn't be president of China. He couldn't be a village prefect in China because you know to be to achieve a position of high power in china you have to have decades of experience meeting people's needs you have to have made the lives of hundreds of millions of people better um you know that's how our democracy works because our democracy is based around representing the interests of the masses of the people um and and china's been very clear they're not going to accept this um and danny and i have written an article about this um um this universalization of liberal democracy, you know, and when when the summit for democracy was announced last year, Xi Jinping made a very interesting quote. He said, "If the people are awakened only at voting time and they're dormant afterwards, if people hear big slogans during elections but they have no say afterwards, if people are favoured during canvassing but they're left out after elections, that's not a true democracy." And that hits pretty hard to the crux of the difference between capitalist democracy and socialist democracy. You know, the truth of capitalist democracy is that it's fundamentally plutocratic more than it is democratic. Whereas people's democracy, socialist democracy, is about representing the people, meeting the needs of the people, engaging the people, uh, you know, following the mass line. And and one one thing that struck out uh, struck me as well from this Congress is that there's they're making a big call to rejuvenate the party in terms of kind of cultivating a new generation of leadership with a particular focus on the young, with a particular focus on women, with a particular focus on ethnic minorities, and with a particular focus on the working class. So, you know, that's a that's a very interesting theme. And, and the other thing I'd just like to touch on quickly is, as, as we've talked about a little bit already, ecological civilization, because it's been one of Xi Jinping's key themes over the course of the last 10 years, and they've really doubled down on it at this Congress. Um, and actually, I just, I think it's important to talk about it because it's such a kind of crying shame that more of the Western left doesn't caught on to what, what's going on in China in relation to combating uh, climate breakdown um, and, and promoting biodiversity, tackling pollution and so on. Um, and actually what China's rolling out in a massive way is kind of what the left, what the kind of radical fringe elements of the left have been calling for, which is a completely comprehensive Green New Deal. And there was a really nice quote in, a, in an interview with the Marxist ecologist, uh, John Bellamy Foster, where he says, while China has made moves to implement its radical conception of ecological civilization, which is built into state planning and state regulation, the notion of a Green New Deal has taken concrete form nowhere in the West. It's just a slogan at this point without any real political backing within the system. It was talked about by progressive forces and then rejected by the powers that be. You know, so that's the West. Meanwhile, in China, you've got Xi saying at a party congress 
nature provides the basic conditions for human survival and development. We will protect nature and the environment as we do our, our very own lives. And, you know, they've, they've talked many times about never before, never again allowing um, the needs of, of economic growth to, super, to go in, in front of the needs of humanity's future and the planet's future. Obviously, China's made its historic contribution to reach zero carbon by 2060, to reach peak carbon emissions before 2030. And these are extremely significant commitments. Um, and, you know, if they achieve them, which, you know, history would tend to indicate they will because the, the Chinese are in the habit of meeting their commitments and, and keeping their promises, then that will be by far the fastest that any country has gone from industrial revolution to peak carbon to zero carbon, like far and away. Um, China's already become, as you've mentioned uh, earlier on our conversation, unquestioned world leader in renewable energy. It's responsible for fully a third of all renewable investment globally. There's, a, it's estimated that worldwide there are 11 million jobs in the renewable energy industry, and over 4 million of those are in China. Meanwhile, China's carrying out the largest reforestation campaign in the world. Just 40 years ago, in 1980, China's forestation, its forest coverage was 12% of the country, and now it's 24% of the country, which is incredible and unprecedented progress. And you can compare that with the situation in Brazil, for example. Um, so, you know, the, the Congress has really strongly affirmed this idea of ecological civilization, which is very much like the Green New Deal, with the important difference that it's actually happening. It actually has political support across the board, and it's taking place on a more or less unimaginable scale. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is incredible seeing what China is doing right now in terms of fighting climate change, especially when you compare it to Western governments, and particularly the US government, where there are still many US politicians, including former President Trump, who deny that climate change is real. Trump called it like a Chinese conspiracy. And this is also, it's easy to make fun of, you know, uh, knuckle dragging Republicans, but Democrats aren't really doing much either to combat climate change. And in, the United, in, uh, in Europe, it's basically the same. There are very few politicians in Europe, you know, Macron, whoever prime minister is going to be next week in, in Britain or a month from now, because it seems like it's going to change every few months. Uh, they're doing nothing basically to, to combat climate change. And in, in the report that she gave to the party Congress, there's an entire section that talks about pursuing green development and promoting harmony between humanity and nature. And they have very, you know, um, important commitments here in terms of pollution control, ecological conservation, cutting carbon emissions, reducing, reducing pollution, expanding green development. And the reason they can do that, of course, is because they talk about coordinated industrial restructuring. That is to say, state-led co coordinated industrial redevelopment and restructuring. So the reason they can do that is because China has a socialist model in which the state leads the economic development of the country, as opposed to the capitalist model in you know, the West, especially in the United States, but also in Europe and many other parts of the world where corporations determine what state policy is. Um, Danny, I know we're going to wrap up in a few minutes here. I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts, any topics you wanted to, to address before we conclude. You're muted. I'll, I'll oh. unmute you. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So definitely just to follow up on this idea, this concept of ecological conservation and China's real people's war uh, on climate change and environmental catastrophe. I, I mean, one of the things, and Carlos mentioned this, is that so what I think tragic about this issue is that China is, in, led by the CPC, is in a real way fighting. So you have some forces that believe in some kind of green fascism model, and then they say that China's Belt and Road Initiative is the way forward, and, and there's never any acknowledgement that China, led by the CPC, is actually leading the way in this fight. And it's not just the astounding progress already made, right? Some of the numbers that Carlos cited, uh, there's others like China making up a fourth of all of the world's uh, reforestation, 
right? Uh, China leads the world by far in electric vehicle production, consumption. Uh, uh, we can go on and on. Wind energy, solar energy. Uh, and you mentioned it, Ben. Uh, China, led by the CPC, is not just trying to meet those markers and improve on them, but also trying to change the way with renewable energy, how the means of production themselves uh, uh, are composed, like using reorienting industry so that kind of like how China through its state owned companies was able to reorient it, reorient its entire system of production to address a pandemic. It's trying to do the same with climate change, which of course is an even bigger task over time. But yet China is well on the way toward meeting this goal of carbon neutrality by 2060. So uh, I think it's tragic that this is happening with a population as the work report, the Communist Party of China's work report said that uh, socialist modernization for a population of 1.4 billion Chinese people is incredibly significant for the rest of the world. And this includes this question of climate change and how China is addressing the environment. But a lot of people ignore this. I mean, the most so-called progressive politicians across the West, they ignore this. And in fact, they go along with the anti-China narrative that the Communist Party is some kind is the biggest polluter, right? It's a political leader in this polluting regime without any acknowledgement of all of these achievements and how China is going as one of the biggest, the biggest country in the world to ever have existed, going from underdevelopment, extreme poverty, to uh, in industrialization, to socialist modernization, all the while addressing and fighting climate change. I mean, it, it's astounding. And I think one last point I want to make is that in the lead up to the 20th Com uh, Co National Congress of the Communist Party of China, uh, the Biden administration released its 2022 national security strategy, where it outright named once again, right, this isn't new, but it named once again China as the biggest threat to the U.S.'s so-called national security, its biggest geopolitical challenger. And I think this was very intentional because uh, the United States wants to assert, it wants to assert that China is the enemy of humanity. Well, everything that the Communist Party of China is doing at this Congress, releasing all the information, all of its actions, it's saying that actually uh, the Communist Party of China is a friend of humanity. doesn't mean that it's the perfect friend. There are no perfect friends. It doesn't mean that it is a pure friend. There's no pure friend. This is a, a socialist process. This is a dialectical process. This is one that the Communist Party of China is very vocal about, very open about, that it's about uh, walking a path toward the ultimate mission of fulfilling the promises to the Chinese people into the world of being a force for human progress and being a socialist force for uh, a human progress. So uh, the, con the, the, the contradistinction here, the uh, ability to see how the United States at all costs is trying to undermine everything that China is doing and in effect, attempt at regime change where the Communist Party of China is no longer in power. Uh, these futile attempts, these desperate attempts make the world more dangerous, actually make it harder to achieve goals like carbon neutrality when you have the Biden administration sanctioning, for example, uh, key industries, the solar industry in Xinjiang, which makes uh, the polysilicone, which is very important to any kind of solar and, and most renewable energy infrastructure. When you have the Biden administration doing such actions on the basis of, quote unquote, human rights, weaponizing human rights, uh, you have the Communist Party of China actually walking the walk, right? It doesn't just talk the talk, but it walks the walk. It corrects mistakes, it corrects errors along the way. But at the same time, by walking the walk alongside 96 million people, all of the family members, all of the connections to the rest of the Chinese people, essentially making up the entire, nearly the entire 1.4 billion uh, population in China, uh, by doing that, you see re real tangible results in all of these areas from the whole process, people's democracy, from climate change, from uh, being able to address the environmental catastrophe that global capitalism has laid before us, from addressing poverty, pandemics. Uh, we can go on and on and on from being able to improve the standard of living of all people, not just Chinese people. But the World Bank itself says that the Belt and Road Initiative, just in its transportation infrastructure, will lift 
several tens of millions of people out of extreme poverty and many millions more out of moderate poverty. So you have real tangible results that I think the rest of the world can see. And I think it's so important that we continue to have these conversations where we are and to who we reach, because honestly, not many people have been speaking about this singular event. Not many people have been. I think I can name on top of my on, on one hand, right? Breakthrough news, socialist program. Other than that, Dong Shang, other than that, not many other outlets, even independent outlets, even those who profess themselves to be of the left, are willing to talk about this because of how effective the US's new Cold War campaign against China has been. So it's it's incredibly important that we talk about this in real sober terms and in terms that actually reflect the reality of where the Communist Party of China is going, where China as a whole is going, and what it means for all of us. Very well said. I couldn't agree more, Danny. And I, I, I will say, I'll take this opportunity to say that, um, as Danny said, we, we, the three of us agree that it's very important to have these conversations more often. And we've kind of decided that um, informally, it's not going to be every month at the same time, but we're going to do a monthly live stream between the three of us that's going to be co-hosted by uh, my channel multipolarista by danny's channel the left lens and also by friends of socialist china um, which carlos helps to edit and uh, i do want to point out that someone um i want to thank all the the super chat commenters and everyone who commented in general but there was someone here in the chat um john jarecki who asked if there's a good book or video that explains china's politics and how it works. Well, you're in luck, John. Uh, not only is there a single book or a video, but there's an entire website with a collection of books and videos and articles. And that is Friends of Socialist China. You can find that at socialistchina.org. And in fact, Danny and Carlos are the co-editors of Friends of Socialist China. I'm on the advisory board with a lot of other people. Um, it's a great resource. And I would recommend everyone watching this. You should, of course, subscribe to my channel, Multipolarista. You should subscribe to Danny's channel, The Left Lens. And you can also, you should subscribe to the Friends of Socialist China channel that Carlos helps to edit. So there's a lot of resources there. Um, but yeah, I'm, you, you guys should go ahead and jump in. I mean, I, I just said that um, we're, we're going to be doing this kind of informal monthly stream talking about these issues like the new Cold War. Uh, you know, what what actually is happening in countries like China and Russia and countries in Latin America and imperialism, because as Danny said, I think it's very important, especially for progressive minded people, people on the left, socialists to have a better understanding of imperialism in order to better organize, because we are in this moment of profound economic crisis, especially in the imperial core. And we're also seeing a, a global shift in the political and economic system. Uh, and I think that there are many positive things about that and that shift that we're seeing it offers a lot of opportunities for revolutionary movements to transform the global political and economic infrastructure and architecture so i think it's it's really at this moment it couldn't be more more important to have these conversations more often carlos any final thoughts to be honest, I think you've summed up really well. You know, I would just really uh, encourage the audience. So, you know, thank you, by the way, to the audience for tuning in. I really encourage people to follow up on these conversations, do more of your own research, do more study, understand what's going on in China, understand what's wrong about what the imperialist media says about China, what imperialist politicians say about China, understand why they say what they say, and understand that this isn't, um, you know, this isn't just a matter of not liking Chinese socialism. This isn't just an attack on socialism with Chinese characteristics. It's an, it's an attack on the very notion of socialism. It's an attack on the history and culture and politics of the global working class. It's an attack on the very concept, the very notion, the very idea that humanity can do things differently, that we can move beyond a capitalist and imperialist system, which cannot solve the problems that remain to be solved for human society, that cannot provide uh, homes for homeless people in one of the richest countries in the world, the United States, that cannot provide uh, health insurance for millions of people in one of the richest countries in the world, the United States, that cannot solve you know, inequality, that cannot solve malnutrition. You know, that, that's, you know, only socialism can solve these major problems that humanity still faces. And when the capitalist media and the capitalist politicians attack China, 
that's what they're attacking, the, the notion that we can do things differently. Of course, and this is the reason for the new Cold War that we talk a lot about. Like the first Cold War that ended you know, around 1991, the new Cold War is also a class war. All wars are class wars, and the new Cold War is a class war led by the financialized neoliberal capitalist model led by the United States, but also with European powers playing a role. It's, it's a war led by this financialized neoliberal capitalist model against China's socialist model and also against other alternative paths of economic development. Russia is not socialist, but Russia is a key ally of China and Russia does have a more uh, state-led industrial capitalist model with state control of the strategic natural resources, including gas and oil and other natural resources. And uh, there are large state-owned banks in Russia. And the idea of a U.S. The U.S. having a state-owned bank is just completely anathema to everything that the neoliberal economic model is based on. So in order to understand this new Cold War that is pushing us right now to the brink of nuclear war, it's really important to have this, this class analysis of what's going on. Because without that, people are going to be confused and they won't understand why we should oppose the new Cold War, why it's so important, not only because it could lead to nuclear war that destroys human civilization, but because... This is a class war that hurts those of us who are part of the working class, and we shouldn't be allying with our oppressors in the capitalist class. Um, I just want to thank Lavender Eucalyptus. Thank you so much for the super chat. Um, thanks for supporting our work. Um, I also want to thank um, John Snow for the, the, the comment as well, the super chat. Um, we appreciate all of the support, all the super chats. Thanks to John. Um, all will be well. All manner of things will be well. Thanks. Uh, uh, Danny, I'll give you the final word as we conclude here. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, there's so much to say, but I think to just add on to your point, Ben, I think one of the biggest and most important reasons why we need to talk about China through a class analysis and through this uh, de this development analysis, this idea that this new Cold War is a class war is because everything about it, everything that is happened, that is being done to China, all of the tar all of the aggression from the United States, all of the targeting, all of this imperialist hand wringing, it has a significant uh, consequences for all of us, you know, for our lives. For how we live our day-to-day -day lives we've seen the rise of anti-asian anti-chinese racism uh, we've seen the rise of mccarthyism of censorship and uh, we've seen how this campaign is is not just a campaign toward china is the stated number one so-called security threat of the united states it is the number one geopolitical target of the united states's empire but everything that uh, the United States does around the world, it's a dialectical process. It is not just that it is toward this larger goal of regime change of China, toward China, but also it's a part of a process whereby the United States and its allies, its imperialist allies, see any alternative to its hegemony as the major threat. And so while China is the biggest one, it also sees China as part of a continuous process in this struggle for socialism. That is why the Belt and Road Initiative is such a so-called threat to the United States and its allies. That is why China is not the only country. That's why Russia is also uh, under the US's crossfire. That's why we have this proxy war, this NATO-led proxy war in Ukraine. That's why we have constant attempts at regime change in Venezuela, in Cuba, in Bolivia, and we can go on and on and on in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, all across the African continent. Uh, all of it can be directed back toward this larger goal of containing and overthrowing China and also connected back to this ongoing process for the struggle for socialism and a true independence, true liberation from imperialism and neo-colonialism that the United States leads. And so you know, there's so much that we can discuss. And I know in our streams, we will continue to discuss each of the components of this. 
Uh, but I think it's so important that even to just have the basic analysis of this being a class war and that China is on the right side of it goes a long way toward bringing us on the correct path and hopefully bringing others along this path with us so that we can actually be effective in our media work and our activities and our activism and our organizing for peace, but also for the things that we truly want. Because when we really look at the granular, when we really get to the details, when we have a concrete analysis of these concrete conditions, we see that everything that China is fighting for is really what we all want to be fighting for as well. What the CPC is laying out in his work report, it, it, a lot of it is what we want to be fighting for as well in our own conditions, in our own communities, in our own society. And then this vision, this larger global vision of peaceful cooperation is one that I think, while it doesn't have the same maybe bluster of the first Cold War of internationalism, it has the same root message, which is to uh, end this uh, really sociopathic model of global exploitation on behalf of capital and bring about mutual cooperation among equal partners, equal nations, equal peoples together toward the goal of bettering humanity, bettering the life of all people, and uh, really getting to a point where these class contradictions are transformed into new contradictions and hopefully transform this very notion of exploitation to its rightful end. So I think all these conversations that we're going to have are going to be so important moving forward. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so what we'll be doing every month or so, we'll be having a live live stream like this. Um, I'm Ben Norton with Multipolarista. Denny Haifong has his channel, The Left Lens, and Carlos Martinez has his channel, Friends of Socialist China. So look, check us out every month. Um, follow all of our channels, please. I want to thank everyone who joined. It was a great stream today. I thought the conversation went very well. I want to thank all of the super chats, uh, CPP, um, Marcel David, uh, Sebo Miner, Sabel Miner, uh, Jorge Maya, uh, Leon Leffer, Leon Leffer. Um, thanks to everyone. It was a really great conversation. Um, and this will be available as a podcast after. So if someone, if you uh, prefer listening instead of just watching it, um, I'll have it as a podcast at Multipolarista. And of course, the video will be available at all of our channels. So thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you all next time.